welcome to the School of Laughs podcast, brought to you by SchoolofLaughs.com. Whether you're an aspiring comedian, a part-time pro, or a speaker who wants to become funnier, this is the podcast for you. We'll break down tools, tips, and techniques to help you get bigger, better, and more bookable. And now, here's the show. Welcome to the podcast. Rick Roberts here. And today I've got Carrie. She's going to be talking to us about how to write better, her kind of barometer for when she knows something's funny and when it's not. She's going to talk to us about writing scripts. She's done that. She's written two scripts that she's uh, sold to Hallmark. She's written other scripts as well. She's written five books, so she knows what she's talking about when she's talking about writing. Been a full-time professional stand-up comedian for 16 years, based in Los Angeles, California. Uh, was a groundling for a while, and she was on Late Night, uh, Tonight Show, those kinds of things. She knows what she's talking about, and she's going to drop a couple of dimes here today on some things you should be doing and things we all should be doing to get better and funnier. I would like to thank today's sponsor for this episode, Paul Swan. Paul is sponsoring us through Patreon. Patreon is kind of like an online tip jar where you can contribute a little bit to help me keep going and pay for the hosting of this podcast. Paul's contributing at a level where he's invited to join Club 52, which is a weekly email nudge. Gives you one specific thing you can do to get bigger, better, and more bookable. We talk about writing tips. I give you strategic things to do goal-wise as well as performing tips. So it's a little bit of everything that you need to get going, get bigger, get better, get more bookable. If you want to find out more about Patreon, you can do that. Go to schooloflast.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E. E-O-N. Thanks, Paul, for doing that. Also, two quick plugs. I've got a comedy class, performing class, coming up here in Nashville. Live performing class, July 8th, 15th, 22nd. It's a three-part class. Those are all Mondays. Cost is 200 And we get you up on stage, get you feedback. You do the same for classmates. And we'll top it off down the road with a graduation show at a club somewhere here in Nashville. All kinds of good stuff going on there. Last thing before we jump into Carrie's episode is if you would like to take the online writing class, I've been getting some inquiries lately, uh, people asking, do you have any coupon codes for that? Which is totally fine. Guess what? I do. Because you listen to the podcast, you get a 20% off coupon for the silver edition, the entry-level edition to the writing class. Uh, The class will help you identify over a dozen, I think there's 17 actually, techniques that we address to write better, to uh, kind of get your comedy focused, streamlined, and funnier, which we'll be talking about today on this podcast, how you can be funnier. What's the ratio of talking to laughing? Stuff like that's important. You can learn that on the online class. Go to schooloflast.com. Go to the next classes link. Scroll down to see the online class. The comedy code that will get you the 20% discount is Better Comedy. Better Comedy. Use that at checkout. Get 20% off. Make Better Comedy one big long word, all capitals like an old guy trying to text for the first time, and you nailed it. All right, welcome to the podcast. Rick Roberts here, and I've got a return guest, Carrie Pomeroli. How's it going, ma'am? Hi, Rick. Greetings from sunny California. Yeah, I bet it is sunny out there. Are you avoiding the mudslides and fires and everything in between? Oh, yeah. As long as I don't get an earthquake, I'm fine to live here. And earthquakes (laughs) are really only like seven seconds, so we're good. There you go. Well, I'm happy to have you back. We we talked a while back about being open to creativity and and how that can guide your comedy. But I thought today we'd get a little bit more into um, just the the skill of comedy, how it's developed, how you help people along with it, and some lessons you've learned over the years of how to get really good at writing jokes and writing scripts and all those things. Yeah, I have. I do have a website if people want to get in touch with me. It's called thelaughdoctor.com. But um, you know, I've been doing professional comedy 13 years. I'm a, a writer. I'm writing my fifth book. It's coming out this this fall. And I'm also a screenwriter and um, just sold my second project to the Hallmark Channel. So writing is a love of mine. And I think that that writing is a partner with being a good comedian because the number one thing that I think comedians need to be are good writers. If you don't know how to write well, I don't care how good of a performer you are. If you don't have punchlines and punchlines and punchlines, you're not going to be effective on stage. So um, I think that's really key when people come to me and they're like, well, I think I'm funny. And I'm like, yeah, but there's a formula to being funny. If you want to admit that or not, I think we would both agree, right, Rick? 
yeah, there definitely is a system to it. And if you stray from that, you'll have a much bigger struggle. Well, when I thought about doing stand-up comedy, I was completely clueless. And I got Judy Carter's book, The Comedy Bible, which I highly recommend. And I took from Judy Carter out here in L.A. And uh, I learned, you know, and I'm sure you've gone over that in other podcasts. Like, you know, there is a, a formula to writing jokes. But I had people that mentored me. Uh, Sherry Shepard, for instance, Bone Hampton, for sure. Bone Hampton was um, my mentor for several years. And if you have him on your podcast, he will um, tell you that he like, you know, gave birth to me in the comedy world and everything <laughs> I've ever done is because of him. Uh, but no, he really is. We laugh now. Cause he's like, um, he's like, remember when I used to tell you like what shirts to wear on stage, but like, there's such a, there's such a business to it that people don't realize like everything from the way that you set up the chairs in your room to the way that you present yourself and what you wear on stage and how you walk on and how you hold the microphone. like, there's a, it's a business and it's an art form. Um, for sure, Rick. Absolutely. And I'd be happy to share some of the things that I learned along the way early on. Absolutely. So I I think a lot of times, and I know from teaching classes, people come in and their number one reason for being there is my friends tell me I'm funny and I should do this. But what I'm not hearing is I love to write and I want to get better at it so that my performances will be strong. You never hear somebody walk in with that. So Well, do you- and I don't even know if they, they know that yet. You know what I mean? Like that's when you get in a class. My first advice 101, get in a class, get a coach. Like there, then you've got the blank slate. But yeah, I don't even think they realize what they're getting into. That's for sure. So what were some of the first things you learned early on that kind of helped you get along the way a little bit quicker? Stage time, stage time, stage time. And people hate to hear it. There's no substitute for stage time. I don't care that you are busy and you have three kids and you have a full-time job. If you want to be a comedian, you need to get on stage all the time. I don't care if that means teaching a Sunday school class. And every Sunday you do your act or you're going to host the potluck dinner at the local Elks Lodge or you start an open mic. I started my own open mic at a cafe because you have to be on stage all the time. To be honest with you, Rick, you know, we were just joking before we um, started the podcast, how we are feeling a little, a little older, a little more tired lately. I don't know if I have, I would have the energy to do what I did when I first started, but um, there's no substitute. I was doing it all for free. Get the idea of money out of your head. You're not going to get paid. You shouldn't get paid for at least a couple of years. Uh, 500 shows, 500 shows before you even have your feet underneath you. And I didn't believe that. And as a comedian who's been working professionally for 12 years now, I think it's, I think it's true. Uh, and one of the other things that I used to do, I learned this from Bo and I also learned this from Dat Fan. He's a comedian who won last comic standing. I would watch my set uh, on a DVD or whatever. Back in the day, it wasn't my phone. It was watching it on a DVD and with a pen and paper. And Bone and I would make sure that there was a laugh punchline every seven seconds. Ten, if I'm really pushing it. But there needs to be a punchline every seven seconds. And if you're watching yourself and two minutes go by and a minute and a half go by and you're putzing around, you're not doing stand-up <laughs> comedy. And if you don't believe me, go watch your favorite comic, Jim Gaffigan, Brian Regan, whoever you like, Rick Roberts, uh, watch them and see how quick they are to get a laugh because you do what we call the setup. You know, you know, what's hard about, you know, being a parent today, for example, and, then you do uh, the punchline. And then after you do the punchline, you do a tag and then you do another tag. So that is, I'm trying to think of a joke for my ex. So I would say kids are too, kids are too soft today. And then that's my setup. I don't want to raise money for them to have a Nerf playground. That's my setup. <laughs> I want them to suck it up on the gravel on the blacktop and ride the merry-go-round wheel of death like we did. Laugh, laugh, laugh. I want them to go down that silver slide with the grates on it and their short shorts and come home bleeding. Laugh, laugh, laugh. I want them to play with real darts like we did. Laugh, laugh, laugh. And then I just keep doing that. That same setup, I have like 10 tags for that. Right. So, and I'm not saying you have to have that with every joke, but it's kind of like, I'll be talking to moms and I'll be like, well, you know, the real reason, um, is because my mother didn't breastfeed me and that's why we fight. Laugh, laugh, laugh. Oh, I see you're convicted. Laugh, laugh, laugh. There's still time. Laugh, laugh, laugh. 
So pretty much every joke that I tell has two to three tags on it because I worked hard to come up with that premise. I might as well write it out for as long as I can. But what people in the beginning stages of comedy are doing is they're coming up with funny ideas and funny premises. And then they talk about it and talk about it. (laughs) But the punchline is, you know, I don't know where it is. And what we used to learn from Judy Carter is your stand-up is like a Western Union telegram. You pay for every word that comes out of your mouth. So you don't need to be like, you know what I mean, girl? Or you know what I'm saying? Or yeah, um. And I will watch my sets now and I get so mad at myself if I'm being lazy or um, like I'm doing now, like I'm trying to think of something on stage. I'm like, yeah, well, that right. doesn't need to be there. That does not need to be there. That's a yeah. crutch. We do it when we're thinking or, you know, I didn't plan out my set the way I wanted it to. And I'm up there, I'm up there winging it. Uh, but so hopefully those are a couple things that I've kind of, I drill people, drill, drill, drill. Where's the punchline? Where, show me. Now, when I coach people in the beginning, I give them punchlines and I help them mm-hmm. understand. This is, they'll give me a premise. You know, Lisa Mills, when she was uh, really early on, would start to work on things like, uh, oh, you know, it's, it's easier being a heavy girlfriend. It's, I'm harder to kidnap. You know what I mean? And so we would work on like the premise of what it's like to be not the skinny friend. And when they come to your house with, you know, yoga DVD and you slam the door in their face and you want to eat macaroni or whatever that was for her, that was her reality. So I always just tell new people to say, write your premises and then figure out a class or a coaching system that will teach you how to write a punchline. Cause it's just, it's a skill. You know what I mean? I don't expect anybody listening to this podcast to be like, okay, I'm just going to write jokes. That's a hard thing to learn. You have to learn it from someone. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. And I even find that sometimes – well, I find two things with new students especially is they almost invert what you just told them to do, which is one setup and a bunch of tags. They'll have a setup that they say 10 different ways, which just confuses the audience and belabors the point and you know delays the punchline. They're like, you know, I'm single. It's not easy being single. Single's rough out there. How many married people in the crowd? How many single people? And then you're like, do the joke already. Well, if you give them the seven seconds rule – then they can't get away with that. I think early on, you got to be tough on them. I joke that Bone used to make me cry. He literally used to make me cry. And not because he's a mean person, but I used to tell him he was like Bella Caroli, the Russian gymnastics coach, or like Bobby Knight, the Indiana basketball coach. Because if it wasn't really, really good and he knew I could do better, we would sit and go over my set. And then I'd be like, he's not wrong. Like, He's not wrong. I need to be better. And another tip I can give young comedians or young in the, not young age wise, but new comedians, surround yourself with better comedians than you. Surround yourself with the best comedians. I remember doing a show with Carlos Oscar. It was really, really new. And I did okay. I opened for him and it was decent. And the sun was coming through the room and it was like a daytime thing. And he went out and killed and destroyed that crowd. And I just sat backstage going, I might quit now. Like, I don't know <laughs> yeah. if I could ever do that. I should just pack it up. But watching him and watching people like Sherry Shopper, just and Bone and Thor Ramsey and Darren Strublo and all the people that I admired and kind of came up with, uh, just kill it made me go, I want to be that. I'm right. not settling. That's the, that's the bar. Certainly. Like, I think a lot of comics get comfortable being at a certain level and they know what to expect from themselves, but they don't put themselves in a competition, maybe, or they go to some contest, which I'm not a big fan of the contest, but I'm a big fan of putting yourself up against, yeah, but against other people who are doing their best against your best. And you can evaluate, not worrying about trying to win the the contest, but where am I stacking up? And if you stack up on the top, then, hey, that's great. That's great. And I also think people pigeonhole themselves. They're like, I only want to do women's shows or I only want to do church shows or I only want to do charity shows. I'm like, you are a comic. 
you need to do comedy wherever they ask you. I don't care. I've done shows where the garage door is my opening. You know, I mean, I've come out. <laughs> we could both tell stories of like, I've done comedy on a hay bale. I've done comedy on a chair in a banquet room with no mic. Don't put yourself in that. That that's that's uh, I'm being really mean today, but that's lazy thinking. Yeah. Don't think that you're just a church comic uh, because I've done churches. I do churches a lot. Uh, they're the nicest people in the world. They're Christians. They're not going to tell you, you suck. They're right. just going to like nod politely and give you some cookies. And then you're <laughs> going to be like, I'm amazing. Go down to the local open mic and do comedy for drunk people. They'll tell you the truth. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. keep your, I'm not saying you have to go in the bars, but I mean, first of all, I don't think it's a bad idea. You got to do comedy for everybody that'll listen to make sure that you're really funny. I think church people are overly forgiving and it hurts comedians sometimes. Right. Uh, back to bone. I guess you can email him now and be like, Carrie talked about you the whole podcast. But um, I got asked to do a CD with a couple of the comics and bone was like, don't do it. And I was probably a year or two in and I could have done it. And he's like, don't do it. And I'm like, what? Why? And he's like, because that's going to be uh, forever. It will follow you for the rest of your life. And like, whatever. You, and I, I, I don't advise putting all your stuff on YouTube when you're new. Because that's your resume. If it's not awesome, don't put it on the internet. Mm -hmm. Don't put mediocre stuff on the internet. Uh, it's going to stay there forever. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, and when we... people hire you for jobs, they're going to go to your YouTube. Right. How do we convince somebody that's new to be patient? Because I know when I first started, I wanted to go everywhere. And I was on the, the go do every show mode for sure. So I had that going on. But, you know, I probably would have jumped at opportunities a little earlier than I wanted to. OK, I have a story about that. So I was doing a show in a club with um, I love to brag about this because he's killing it right now. But Zach Levi was our host. He's Shazam and uh, Bone and Sherry. And I did nine minutes and it was probably like the best nine minutes I'd ever done. Now I came to comedy. I was already a groundling. I'd been in groundlings and I'd been in second city improv. So I kind of knew what I was doing, but so I did nine minutes for an audience. that was on fire. It, I crazy, crazy. The laughs were insane. There was an agent there from a place called outreach comedy. Um, Dan Pettipas. I did nine minutes. Cause that's all I had nine minutes, like solid killer nine minutes. So she says, Hey, do you want to sign with my agency? And uh, I'm like, heck yeah. And, he, and then she goes, talking a bone, because he was kind of like my manager, sort of and unofficially. Does she have 40 minutes? We're like, heck yes, yeah, she does. Yes. Right. <laughs> so two seconds later, I'm on a plane to Atlanta and I'm doing this church show for an hour, an hour. Ooh. And I got a call and I still get sad and my blood curls when I remember this phone call. I just signed with this agency. They called me and they said, um, we got a call from the client. And I was like, uh-huh. They're like, <laughs> they thought you were lovely. I'm like, uh-huh. And they're like, they said you did nine minutes of comedy and 51 minutes of testimony. <laughs> <I was like, laughs> yeah. Uh, do they want their money back? I mean, it was one of the only like official complaints to this day that still makes me shudder. But I, you can't fake it. You can't fake comedy. You can't fake stand up. Even now, next weekend, I'm going back to this uh, venue where I was in September and I'm doing three shows for them. And I was just there in September and I'm freaking out because I'm like, I got to get new stuff and the old stuff I do has to be amazing. And I'm like, really a perfectionist about that. I can't fake it with them. They saw my A game in September. Right. So I got to bring another A game. So um, convincing them to be patient is like, you're only going to hurt yourself. I mean, what's your big goal? Is your goal to be a respected comedian or is your goal to make like $10 a show right now and a hundred dollars here and a hundred dollars there and not build any reputation for yourself? Cause what you do, you know, at money shows, not open mics, but money shows and things like that. That's, that's word of mouth. If you're not good, they're going to tell other people they were okay. Right. Right. So do comedy in protective environments. Do comedy at like, you know, host something, host a charity dinner, host a fish fry, be the host. And then you can just flip your act into your hosting. There's, there's all kinds of situational things that can affect the show. What are some things that comics can do that you consider like 
the qualities of a good performance? Like, what should they focus on to make themselves different and, and memorable? First of all, when you're performing, record yourself every single time. Every single time you get up on stage, look presentable. Don't just look presentable. Look like you put effort into it. Um, I was doing a show with Bob Smiley the other day and my flight was delayed and I was really stressed out and I showed up pretty much from the airport and I had on, um, jeans and a flannel shirt and a baseball cap. And I was like, never would I ever wear that. But that's what Bob wears all the time. Right. And Bob Smiley, who's a comedian, he looked at me and he goes, Oh, I like this new look. It's like the housewife that like gave up on everything. (laughs) Like that's and I was like, you know, he's not wrong. Like that was what I was presenting to my audience. And I was doing a single show and I was like, Well, if you guys want to date me, it's not for my clothing, it's because I own property in LA. Right. <laughs> Don't feel rushed to do crowd work right away. That's another thing that'll come with time. Mm-hmm. And uh Anita Renfro gave me some good advice. Whenever she dresses for a show, she goes, I want to look one step above my audience. So like if they're super casual, wear something nice casual. Women don't wear skirts. Comedy does not work in a skirt. Um, Be comfortable on stage. Uh, Make sure that the microphone is set up to the best of your ability. If you have any control over that, where you want it, make sure there's not monitors in front of you. Make sure that you go talk to the sound guy and the lighting guy and girl before. Introduce yourself. Make friends with the tech people. Ask them. I say very simply, please make the audience really, really dark and please make the stage really, really light. That way, no matter what lighting experience they've ever had, they can simply do that. Mm-hmm. So those are just a few that come to my mind. And then uh, I did want to talk to you today a little bit about writing scripts. I have a lot of people that email me asking for tips on that, and I really have never done that. But I know, like you said, you've written books, you've written some stuff for Hallmark. Yeah, and I also do script. I, I do script coaching and script editing and all that stuff. Um, So I wrote a book in my early 20s and then I got self-published that and then I got it published by a publisher and uh, I got a good editor. I mean, what can I answer? I mean, writing scripts is something that I fell into. It was, I, I, uh, I met a partner, a writing partner who had similarities of goals and, um, you know, we've sold, we sold two scripts in the last six months to the Hallmark Channel. And uh, we've done so many things throughout the years. We feel like, oh, my gosh, you made it. Oh, my gosh, you made it. We're like, no, we've been working at this for 10 years, like selling smaller things and, you know, getting things options. So it's not an overnight process at all. Um, if you want to write scripts, again, I'm going to give you the same advice. Learn the format. People have sent scripts in and I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is like a fifth grade essay. You know what I mean? It's not a script. Right. Like there's, there's like final draft. There's a software. And I'm not trying to say, oh, it's bad that you don't know that. But I'm just saying, find somebody that's written a script or, or look it up online. I mean, people are so lucky today. They can go on YouTube. They can go and find tutorials on script writing. I mean, uh, but then find out what are you writing the script for? That's really some good advice. What are you writing the script for? There's a very, very big difference in a Netflix script and a Hulu script and a Hallmark script. Huge. So write for who you want to sell it to or what you want to happen to it and then write for that. Good. And can you give us like a little idea of what the difference is? Just for Hallmark that. Channel, I'm not even allowed to say the word yoga because uh, that would be too edgy. We can't say uh, green card. There's certain things in the world of Hallmark that are just so straight down the line. Um, we love them, but you know what I mean? Like that's in the world of Hallmark, there's a formula. You look at Hallmark movies, the girl meets the guy, there's a bed and breakfast, a snowstorm and a puppy. And like, you know, <laughs> we wrap it up with a hayride. So, but if I don't write that, they're not going to buy my script. Netflix has a vast array. They've got dirty, dirty, raunchy comedies, or they've got like the family friendly genre. So you kind of want to look at the genre of like, well, because when, and you need a good elevator pitch. You need that good sentence. Like, uh, I wrote a script and it became a musical and it toured in LA and it's called Adventures of the Quarter Slot Sisters. And my elevator pitch is it's the Golden Girls meets the Hangover. So you've got to have your, um, your pitch. Like, what is this? This is, the Sound of Music meets Harry Met Sally in this romantic comedy where love um, is, you know, 
worth the wait. You've got to have that one sentence pitch. Uh, and when you're writing a script and you're pitching a script, you have to get the formula of not just writing the script. You need the character description and the synopsis. And I could go on and on, but that's really something that they would probably learn in a class. Then zooming, you know, a much wider scope and, and picture of it. If they're hearing this, they're thinking about it. We know they can go on YouTube, find some tutorials, but what's the reality as, as far as getting a connection to pitch it to in the first place or knowing what entities are looking for scripts? Very hard. Right. It's very hard. I'm not going to lie about that. It's hard. It's, I'm not saying it can't be done because I did it and I don't have any fancy connections. Uh, or make it yourself, man. I know people that have made amazing movies. The guy who made, you know, uh, gosh, I mean, you and I both know, but just amazing Look at, I mean, go back to Sylvester Stallone. He had 50 offers to buy his script and have somebody else play it. But he's like, no, I'm going to raise the money. And they did on a shoestring budget. Rocky won. Mm -hmm. But um, make it yourself. Get some, I mean, get a camera, like play around. I don't, I don't want to give the false aspirations of like, yes, everybody writes the script gets to sell it to Hollywood. No, I'm out here like schlepping it in Hollywood and taking move, taking meetings and getting rejected and then taking more meetings and getting more rejected. It's not for the faint of heart. Right. It's really tough, but I, I feel like it's a calling and I'm really grateful to be here. That's great. And let me just kind of wrap up with this, uh, between writing books, performing stand up, writing scripts and coaching where if you could put together the ideal day or even the ideal week, what kind of ratio of those things would take up your time? I think that I have so much joy writing with my partner, Claire, uh, with um, carrots, guacamole, and red wine after our kids are asleep, writing scripts and singing. We're writing a parody right now. We wrote a parody musical, and that brings me so much joy to write and create and laugh. Second to that is uh, the ministry that I do where I get to share what God has done and pray for people and see them get joy and healing and wonderful things. And then below that is stand-up comedy because there's no greater rush than making people laugh. And I love to go to a club where nobody knows me and my name's not on the billboard and I have to go up comic number 13 and just like try to kill it, see if I right, do. Right. And it's kind of a crapshoot. And then um, I really enjoy stand-up comedy in, in life just because it, uh, and somewhere in there I should probably bring up that I have two lovely children and I like them. But um, yeah, it's it's kind of like a shuffleboard every single day, but I don't think that I'm cut out for the same thing all the time. So um, I'm blessed. And that's another piece of advice I can leave your listeners with. Don't, pigeon your, don't pigeonhole yourself to one thing. There, that's going to limit you career-wise. If something else comes up, give it a try. That's really good. And that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with people. I'm only going to do church shows or I'm only going to do this kind of show or whatever. Don't let your, your branding and your marketing affect your ability to go out and entertain everybody. Correct. 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 And know that you might try something and realize that it's not for you, but you might be glad that you tried it. Yeah. And if at the worst case scenario, you'll have appreciation for people who can do what you could not do and respect them a little bit more. <laughs> Amen, brother. Well, that's great. Well, I appreciate you joining us again for another episode. If people want to get a hold of you, uh, was it laughdoctor.com is, is one website. Right. The Laugh Doctor, and then um, I do a lot on Instagram these days at Carrie K E R R I Palm, at Carrie Palm on Instagram, and of course you know Facebook and all that. They can find me. I am in the internet. I'm in your computer. If you try hard enough. <laughs> Great. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Rick. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Carrie. I told you. Did I tell you? She was dropping little gold nuggets left and right. Uh, very insightful. And, you know, I think a little bit of tough love. Sometimes we think, hey, I go up there, be funny. And, hey, that was nice. Carrie's like, hey, it needs to be funnier. You went 15 seconds without a laugh. What are you doing up there? Delivering the Gettysburg Address? Come on. Thanks, Carrie. That was great. You can find out more about Carrie again by going to Carrie Palm, K-E-R-R-I-P-O-M.com. Or if you want to check out what she does for coaching, for uh, scripts, as well as stand-up, it's The Laugh Doctor. Dot com doctor just the letters dr the laugh dr dot com find out more about her and follow her on her social media links that she mentioned all that will also be in the show notes thank you again for listening to the school of last podcast we're closing in on the bicentennial 
We're not too far away. 200 episodes around the corner. What's going to happen then? Hmm. Trying to work things out in my brain as we speak. Could go forward. Could shut her down. I don't know. But I do know I've got some other things I need to get to. Trying to figure out if I can do this and that. So uh, keep me in your thoughts, prayers, and uh, we'll see what happens. Either way, I'm here with you today. And I would start backing up some of these podcasts if you haven't yet, just to be sure you have them. All right. Thanks again. Live performance class, July 8, 15, and 22 in Nashville, Tennessee. Online, 20% off coupon from the Silver Edition. And that's uh, Better Comedy is your coupon code for that. Thanks for listening. Stay safe out there, everybody. And stay funny. For listening to the School of Laughs podcast. If you'd like to hear more School of Laughs podcasts, you can find them on iTunes and Stitcher.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. For information on upcoming live and online classes, visit SchoolofLaughs.com. Until next time, stay tuned, stay focused, and stay funny.